Welcome to Resurrection Lutheran Church's online uh, live streaming. This is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we'd like to give thanks to God for you who are uh, faithfully continue your tithes and offering to keep the church's mission going forward. Uh, no virus out there is going to stop this mission of God from going forward. And so we give thanks to God for you uh, to, to help uh, with the tithes and offerings uh, to keep the church uh, operating. And part of that mission is to welcome new members into the church. And so we, we welcome baby Caleb this morning uh, for a, a baptism. Uh, Caleb brought not only his parents, which was good, <laughs> but also his grandparents. So we, welcome, we want to give a special welcome uh, to Pastor Clark and to Susan Jonke this morning, who will be participating uh, and conducting the uh, the, the baptism this morning. So, so welcome, Jockey family. If you're worshiping alone, then know that the peace of God that passes all understanding is with you this morning, and we encourage you to share God's peace as you go throughout the week. If you're worshiping with others at home, then please take a moment to share that peace with them this morning. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Peace. morning everybody we begin today with first of course the name of God the name in, in whom we are baptized but because our baptism is a reminder of God's spiritual washing of us through this Holy Spirit we uh, uh, forgo the confession of sins today focusing instead on the sacrament of holy baptism and what it is that we receive from God's hand as his baptized children today nothing less than the forgiveness of our sins so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite the family to gather at the baptismal font for the sacrament. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority, and on heaven has been, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful, and would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. How is this child named? Caleb, received the sign of the cross, both upon your forehead, upon your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters and you created heaven and earth. Your, by the gift of water you nourish and sustain us and all living things. By the waters of the flood you condemn the wicked and save those whom you chosen, Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea out of slavery into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of the Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, your beloved son has set us free from the bondage to sin and death and has opened the way to, to joy and freedom of everlasting life. He made water a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and rebirth. Pour out your Holy Spirit so that Caleb may be given new life. Wash away his sins as he is cleansed by this water and bring him forth as an heir of your glorious kingdom. To you be given praise and honor and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Nathan and Faith, together with Caleb's sponsors who are taking part in this service at a distance today, in Christian love, you have presented your child for holy baptism. You should therefore remember him in your prayers, remind him of his baptism, faithfully bring him to the services of God's house, and teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. 
As he grows in years, you should place in his hands the Holy Scriptures and provide for his instruction in the Christian faith that living in the covenant of his baptism and in communion with the church, he may lead a godly life until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you intend to do this gladly and willingly? If so, answer yes with the help of God. As we answer for Caleb today, let us confess our faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith into which we baptize. Caleb, do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? I, I do, do renounce, renounce them. them. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Yes, yes I, believe I believe in, in God, God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Yes, yes I, believe I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ his only Son, our Lord, Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? Yes, yes I, believe I believe in the God Holy Spirit, the Holy, Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Caleb, do you desire to be baptized? If so, answer, yes, I do. Caleb, Nathan, John, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you new birth of water and of the Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you, grace everlasting. Amen. 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 Caleb, receive this burning light to show that you have received Christ, who is the light of the world. Live always in the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming, that you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which shall have no end. And we can maybe just speak on behalf of the congregation. Alan, if you could read. Through baptism, God has made Caleb his child, an heir with us of all the treasures of heaven, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We say together, we, we welcome, welcome you into, into the Lord's family. family. We, we receive, receive you as, as a brother in Christ and a member of the, of the priesthood we all share in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you're, you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have granted Caleb new birth and holy baptism, made him a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life, to the praise and honor of your holy name, and finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with the hymn, Father Welcomes.
salvation, life forever has been won. In the water, in the word, in his promise be assured, those who are baptized and believe shall be born again. Father welcomes all his children to his family through his son. Father giving his salvation, I forever has been won. Let us daily die to sin, let us daily rise with him, walk in love of Christ our Lord, live in peace of God. Father welcomes all his children to his family through his Son. Father giving his salvation, I forever has been one. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the working of your Holy Spirit, grant that we may gladly hear your word proclaimed among us and follow its directing. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah, the 28th chapter, verses 5 to 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah replied to the prophet Hananiah before the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. He said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. Nevertheless, listen to what I say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us join together and sing the hymn, Lord of Glory, You Have Brought Us. Oh, 
Today's epistles reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the seventh chapter, starting with verse one. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over man only as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been cleansed from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then, if the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good, did that which is good then become death to me? By no means but in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Read together the Alleluia Alleluia verse found in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Alleluia. Alleluia. Whoever, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, to you Lord. Lord. Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple... I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, Lord Lord Christ. Christ. And this is that part of the service where we invite you, if you're one of what I like to call the younger folks that's uh, gathered in your room watching the service, get a little closer to the TV for the children's message. And I'm just going to move this up. It's a very special time that we've had these last several weeks to be thinking about how God uses us to tell others about Jesus through our words and our actions. 
There's something happening uh, today in the words you might have just heard me read where Jesus tells his disciples basically that there will be many people, even in their own family, who won't receive that message. There will be many that they love that won't understand what his love is all about. But at the same time, he promises them that if anyone receives them as his disciple, they are receiving nothing less than God himself. What does that mean? What is all that about? Well, I'd like to tell you a story, a true story, about a teacher of mine. And she was my teacher when I was studying to be uh, a teacher in Japan. She taught me Japanese. And her name was Miss Mori, Mori Sensei. Mori Sensei was the, one of these fixtures in the school where I studied. The school where I studied was not uh, a school like the one you go to. It was one for future pastors and teachers. And it was here that all of us had to stumble over uh, the mechanics of just what it means to speak a foreign language. Maybe you've studied a foreign language, you know a little bit about that too. And Miss Mori knew the Bible backwards and forwards. She would use uh, words of the Bible to teach us grammar points. But she wasn't a Christian. And we prayed for many, many years that she might know who Jesus is, that one day that knowledge that was head knowledge might also go to her heart. But it didn't happen. And many, many, many years later, uh, she was still teaching, she was still using the Bible in her classes, but uh, she was not a follower. She was not a disciple of Jesus. She wasn't a Christian. It was very interesting to hear the stories of people like me who had studied with her. She had taken us to uh, productions of famous uh, Japanese um, artwork like uh, kabuki and all these things that you don't maybe know what that means, but it has to do with, with fancy stuff that adults go to that helps them learn about a foreign country, culture, things like that. She watched over us and did all that for us. If you were really special, you got to have a cookie when you went to her office to ask her a question. You know, she kind of took care of us like we were kids a little bit. Um, but in all of that, for so many years, uh, she didn't know who Jesus was. And then finally, Finally, I want to say it was about 10 years ago. All of us missionaries who had been together in Japanese lessons with her and had kept in touch with each other over the years, we received word from one of the former missionaries from years long ago that she had been baptized, that she had become a Christian, a believer. Now, when I think back on that, the reason I tell you this story is there might be somebody very close to your heart right now who doesn't know Jesus, somebody who you're praying for. And it's easy to give up and to maybe lose hope for them. But I just want you to know that God is using you in a special way by your prayers, by that longing in your heart for them. And I want you just to hold on to that hope because only God can bring somebody to faith. We can, we can show them love, we can pray for them, but it's only God's hand at work in their life and uh, we saw it happen just a minute ago with little baby Caleb over here. That water holy baptism that brings God's forgiveness for them, his love for them in a very special way, that's God's doing. He uses us as a part of his plan, but it happens on God's time and in God's way. So hold on to that hope for people that you know and love who don't know Jesus. God is using you right now to shine a light for them. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that in holy baptism, thank you that in holy baptism, you make us your children. You make us your children. As we pray for, as we pray for, and show love to, and show love to, people around us, people around us, who don't know you, who don't know you, use our words Use our words and our actions and our actions to help them understand Jesus. To help them understand Jesus. And Jesus' love for them. And Jesus' love for them. In your special time. In your special time. This we ask. This we ask. In our loving Savior Jesus' name. In our loving Savior Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks very much. We continue with the sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, quick question. What is our mission here at Resurrection Lutheran Church? Don't stop and check the church website or anything. Just see if you can remember it. What was it we consistently say as every man, woman, and child connected with this congregation? It's this. By grace, through faith in Christ, we reach out to all with his love and build each other up for service. We might reach out to the love, to, we might reach out to the world with the love of Christ imperfectly. We may at times reach out with the love of Christ even half-heartedly or reluctantly. But we have received the love of God in Christ Jesus so abundantly that God now uses us to share in our words, 
and by our actions what it means to be a child of God, what it means to have received his love, and we do that uh, in our families and in our community and around the world. Over the last three weeks, we've been reading from Matthew chapter 10, and we've been talking about Jesus' missionary church, a church that you and I are privileged to be a part of. It's a topic, you recall, that started with Jesus' instructions to his disciples in week one, that we go to, and I'm quoting um, Eugene Peterson's The Message here, we go to the lost, confused people right here in our own neighborhood. And then last Sunday, week two, we noted Jesus' encouraging words, do not be afraid. Instead of just living as the people we've been recreated to be, instead of living with integrity, we get scared sometimes because we think that sharing the love of God in Christ Jesus with others in our words means following a special script or always having just the right words to say. And then today we come to another message from Jesus, again, quoting from the message. Do not, Jesus says, do not think I have come to make life cozy. Is church life all about being made comfortable? Being, in a sense, taken care of in an inhospitable world? To a certain degree, yes. Comforted? We might say, yes, more comfortable, not really. Today we come face to face with the fact that true and lasting peace can only come at the expense of an easy or automatic peace with the world. And yes, at times, even with those who are closest to us. So on this last day of our mission focus, Jesus surprises us with the message that he did not come to make life cozy. He came to make life meaningful. He didn't come to give us an easy peace with the world. He came to give us real peace, peace with the Holy God and peace with one another. And he came to give us a mission to make a difference in the world, to leave behind a legacy that matters. Or as we say in our church's mission statement, by grace through faith in Christ, we reach out to all with his love by our words and by our actions. Our mission begins with what we can only describe as unexpected outcomes in the kingdom of God. Who would have thought that the one who came to bring peace, the one who promises peace, especially in John's gospel, that he would also claim not to bring peace, but rather a sword? That's what Jesus does. Now, we need to be careful. We need to work at properly reading and understanding what Jesus means by bringing a sword rather than peace. Too many people have claimed to wield a sword on behalf of Jesus over the centuries with devastating consequences. If you want to see what Jesus doesn't mean by what he says when he says he came not to bring peace but a sword, look at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus is arrested. You'll remember the scene, a mob armed with clubs and swords came to take him away. He'll be tried on trumped up charges and then put to death by crucifixion. But when one of his disciples, a disciple we come to learn elsewhere is Simon Peter, takes out a sword and begins to defend Jesus with it, Jesus tells him to put the sword away for all who take up the sword will die by the sword. Jesus had wanted to, he could have summoned a legion of angels at that point in time to protect him, but he doesn't. So what in the world does Jesus mean in this portion of Matthew's gospel when he says he came to bring a sword and not peace? He's telling us, in effect, there are two kinds of peace. A so-called peace, peace that comes from going along to get along, Peace that's the result of a kind of inertia in human relationships, just letting things coast along as they would without any outside interference. The difference between that peace and true and lasting peace, won on behalf of sinners by the perfect Son of God on Calvary's cross. There was a study done at UCLA a few years back that I think gives a kind of certain insight into 
uh, this kind of peer group peace that Jesus says he didn't come to bring. A group of researchers at UC, UCLA apparently scanned the brains of a few dozen adolescents as they watched what looked like an Instagram feed. They said, we showed the exact same photo with a lot of likes to half the teens and to the other half with just a few likes. And when they saw a photo with more likes, they were significantly more likely to like it themselves. Not surprising. But here's where things started to really get interesting. They noticed that when they added likes to photos or, uh, or messages on those photos that the teens had put up themselves, they actually got the teens themselves to think of themselves in a better light. It was sort of like a, a, a response that enabled them to, um, to focus maybe not so much on their own likes and dislikes, but to kind of go along with what everybody out there was thinking was good. And it, it got interesting because they had some photographs that were uh, a little bit more, um, you know, just displaying behaviors that might be questionable, smoking and all this kinds of stuff. And they could actually see by these responses that they manipulated how young people's interests would change. That is a kind of peer pressure piece, you might say, an automatic response. You don't have to be an adolescent or a young person to be in that place either. That response to peer pressure or that need to find comfort and community with others is the very predicament, you might say, that Jesus came to undo. But Jesus warns us such rescue from worldly peace can only come at a cost. Such rescue from worldly peace results in pain and separation from those who will not receive the love of God in Christ. And sometimes such people are the members of our own family. Yes, Jesus' first words to his missionary church was that they should go to the lost sheep of Israel to the lost, confused people right here in our own neighborhood, but even or especially there, Jesus' disciples would face rejection. We might never have expected that gentle Jesus, meek and mild, would have introduced such painful separation into the human family. Yet anyone listening to this message today who has a child or a parent outside the fold will know firsthand the heartache that such separation can bring. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute, but come along with me, okay, as we look at this text. So Jesus, the bringer of peace, doesn't bring us mere peace of mind or an attitude of conformity to the world. He invites an attitude that in many cases will result in separation for those who are not prepared to receive it. But the unexpected outcomes in the kingdom of God continue, don't they? And though the traditional human family would often be divided over matters of faith and new family of brothers and sisters in Christ, all of that would come about as a result of the disciples' message. And that new family, people who like you and me have been declared to be children of our Heavenly Father, brothers and sisters in Christ, people who through holy baptism now have the same words of God pronounced over them that Jesus had in his baptism. These are my beloved children. We are used by God to open doors. This is where another unexpected outcome of the kingdom of God, a blessed and joyful outcome, takes place. Who would have thought that the very people the church is sent to serve might actually welcome and serve them? And in so doing, welcome and serve God too. Jesus sent his disciples out not with wealth or education or worldly wisdom, but with one tunic and the instructions to wait for the welcome of others. Over the years, I don't know about you, but I've complained to God about not having. Not having the time I wanted to get all my work accomplished. Not having the space or resources I thought I needed to devote myself wholeheartedly to the kingdom work I felt called to do. And as the years progress, I expect I'll probably complain to God one day that I don't have the health or the stamina or the ability to serve him in the manner I've grown accustomed to. But here's what I've learned about the missionary activity we're called to be a part of. Sometimes when we swallow our pride and ask for help, especially from those not inclined to share our faith or our hope in an infinite God, 
God actually uses us in ways we could never have imagined to open doors. I ran across a blog this past week from someone who discusses how hard it is to be on the receiving end of another person's generosity. Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 10, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. His followers, he seems to assume, will put themselves in the way of the gift of another's generosity, another person's welcome. And when that welcome is offered, it will be as if Jesus himself has received it. That's not easy. It's not some wonderful romantic notion or very much fun either. But in her book, Dakota, Kathleen Norris tells the story, said to originate in a Russian Orthodox monastery, of an older monk telling a younger one, I have finally learned to accept people as they are. Whatever they are in the world, it's all the same to me. But sometimes I see a stranger coming up the road, and I say, oh, Jesus Christ, is it you again? My neighbor, in all his neediness, is Christ for me. He may exasperate and exhaust me, and surely my impulse to fix, th fix things, to do good, to do something will kick in, for better or worse. But how do I find the freedom and risk the vulnerability to expose my own neediness to somebody else? To risk exasperating and exhausting another person? To receive another's welcome such that they have received Christ in me? Have we considered that the one who welcomes and serves us as disciples of Christ is, though maybe unknowingly at first, welcoming Christ himself? Though the peace of God in Christ might separate us from a fake peace with others, there's another opportunity we have to be a part of that community of God's children that God takes us on. And it's a wonderful journey indeed. So yeah, there are many unexpected outcomes in God's kingdom work among us. That Jesus would bring a kind of separation, a, a pain into our life that uh, we feel that we should not have to endure is one. But the unexpected increase of his kingdom in places that we never thought possible, that's yet another. But there's one more that's so important. Who would have thought the Son of God would take on the sins of the world, and according to his receiving the punishment for sins we deserved, be separated from his Father in heaven. Jesus paid the price for sins once and for all. That doesn't just bring us peace of mind, it brings us reconciliation with a holy yet loving triune God. And with this new reality at work, what does Jesus' sword, which sets a, a man against his father and a daughter against her mother look like? I think every case is different, but in many cases, I think it looks an awful lot like that one who waits, scanning the horizon for that lost son or daughter or mom or dad to come home. It's one that waits and expects and hopes and continues to love because that's the attitude of our God towards us. Jesus Christ, because he took on the sins of the world, was the result of an effort on the part of, of, uh, of mankind to... Let me back up. Jesus Christ, in taking on our sins upon the cross, actually demonstrates what it means to introduce separation into the heavenly household. He suffered all of that for you and for me. And now, as his children who have been brought to newness of life through holy baptism, we have a reason to share his love and, and his very, very special brand of peace with a world that so desperately needs it. We will fall down on the job again and again as missionaries of God, as people who don't always put our mission values into practice. But God is with us every step of the way. He knows the pain we face with those who reject our message. And he encourages us on the journey to know that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the cross, the one who carried his cross perfectly and died for you and me, is with us. His spirit nudges us along, giving us the inspiration we need to be his messengers of peace, to be people who 
simply ask for help sometimes and open the door for others to receive us as they receive Jesus Christ himself. As you strive to be a kind of person who is faithful in your calling, as one who is joined in this wonderful mission that we have, together with all of us here, let's look up to heaven. Let's receive again the gift of sufficient strength that comes from our God. And let's know that his call is with us as we pick up our crosses, follow Jesus, and spread the good news of the kingdom to all who will hear. And as we do, the peace which passes all human understanding will keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We continue with the musical offering. Continue now with the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Most merciful God, Lord of heaven and earth, we pray you to so rule and govern your church and all her pastors and ministers that she may be preserved in the pure doctrine of your saving word, defended against all adversity and protected from all adversaries. Thereby, may faith may be strengthened and love increased in us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant health 
wisdom, and integrity to all in authority over us, especially to the President of the United States, the Governor of North Carolina, the Congress, all legislative bodies, and all judges and magistrates. May your spirit guide them with discernment and respect for your word, that they would serve your good pleasure, that we all may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Lord, we pray especially for the continued racial and social tensions around our nation. Let us reject the sword of this world and rather arm ourselves with the sword of your spirit, which is the word of God, to bring about true peace, won through the sacrifice for sin on the cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you are the great physician. We ask for healing in accordance with your will for those who are sick, especially Emil, Vern, Mary, Terry, Karen, Marty, Elsa, for baby Madison and continued strength and growth. For those who are ill with COVID-19, remembering especially Debbie and Jill today. For Jamie O. and Lois on the upcoming surgeries. We pray for Sandy M. and Jarrett, recovering from surgery. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, you are the comforter. We pray for those mourning the loss of loved ones especially for the family of Jonathan Warden, and for Fuad, prayers for his wife Kathy and their family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those in leadership positions in your churches around the world. Fill them with wisdom and discernment to serve with love. We pray especially for Pastor Jonathan and Julie, for the church council, other area pastors. Lord, lead our Resurrection Lutheran schools and preschool leadership and advisory boards that are planning for the 2020-2021 school year. We pray especially for Tom Kolb, Rosie Creasy, and Diane Hooper. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give to all husbands and wives grace to live together in love and faithfulness. Bless the homes and families of your people that they may be places where your name is honored and love is nurtured. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, for your presence in the homes of our online congregation as we worship together in faith and love. We pray especially today for Andrew and Amy Tharp awaiting for the birth of their daughter. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, hear our petitions and patient endurance. For Dan and Lois Hartling, who are looking for a buyer for their home in Arizona. And for our prayers of thanksgiving, for good test results for a mother, for travel and vacation time, travel safeties. For those we have named aloud and those that we now name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And to your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray trusting that your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan. We continue with the service. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Lord, Lord send, send us out, out to proclaim your, your kingdom, kingdom in, in your, your harvest field. field. Amen. Amen. As the scriptures show us, it's not always easy being workers in the Lord's harvest fields. But we have the good news that our Lord goes with us, and he gives us his blessing today. Receive it again with all of us here. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen close with the Son of God goes forth to war.
stationed bears his cross below. He follows in his train. A noble army, men and boys, the matron in the main, around the Savior's throne rejoice in robes of light. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it has truly been a joy to have uh, to be together this morning in worship. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, if today was your first time with us, thank you for logging on and looking us over. We hope you'll join us again uh, next week, or at least as soon as you can. Uh, if you are interested in receiving additional information about the church, or if you would like to speak with a church staff member for any reason, uh, please call us at 919-851-7248. You can also check us out online at www.rlcary, that's R-L-C-A-R-Y dot O-R-G. May the richest of heavenly gifts be yours this week, and we hope to see you again soon.